Hi, it's me, Dick Jr. again. Uh, I'm going to read you Matthew chapter 9 today. Um, I'm going to take three references uh, out of chapter 9. Uh, I think these are all ones that I've written down myself. So whether that they, if I found them in another book or I found them myself, I don't know. But anyway, these are the ones that I've written down. So in my Bible, I wrote them down, you know, so I know. Anyway, I wrote them down here. Uh, Hosea uh, chapter 6, verse 6. Uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Number 2 is Zechariah. Chapter 10, verse 2. Zechariah, chapter 10, verse 2. And Matthew, chapter 12, verse 7. Matthew, chapter 12, verse 7. Um, okay. I've already prayed, and uh, I'm ready as I can be to read. Uh, hopefully I don't mess this up too bad. Uh, so, chapter 9 starts off. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. I want to stop just for a second as we're going through here. So, this is a miracle that Jesus performs in his own city. See what I mean? And he does it in public. It's a public miracle. Uh, which we'll find out in other places in the Gospels that uh, a prophet is uh, uh, anyways let's just go on with this so uh, it says take courage your, uh, your sins are forgiven and he did it because of the faith of those that were there that he could you see what I mean they believed so he did that's how it worked uh and some of the scribes said to themselves, this is verse 3, uh, this fellow blasphemes, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, so they didn't even open their mouths, they were thinking that he was blaspheming, and he knew that that's what they were thinking. Uh, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Um, and see, they believe that if you were healed in such a manner, then whatever sin you did to deserve to be inflicted in such a manner was forgiven. You see what I mean? That's just how they believe. If you were afflicted, you obviously had some kind of sin in your life, or your family had sinned, and you were bearing a curse of family, or, you know, this is what they believed. Anyway, so, uh, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And what he said right there with that, uh, so that you would know that the Son of Man has authority, um, that's why he said that his sins were forgiven, because he wanted him to hear him say it. And then he wanted him to hear him say the next part, which is get up and walk. And he did. You see what I mean? So that they knew that his he had the authority. You see where I'm at? Because anybody who could make someone get up and walk has the authority to forgive sins because that's what they believe. If you sinned, you were afflicted, you know, and, and if you were forgiven, the affliction was removed. And what, it, I mean, it is a manner of belief and, and, and biblically sound, sort of, but anyway. Uh, but so that, uh, or, Son of an authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. And they were amazed that such authority had been given to men. And um, that's what this is and it's, this authority is promised to be given to men in general who believe and are filled with the spirit so uh, anything's possible through God 
Uh, so, uh, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in a tax collector's booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And uh, tax collectors were hated by everyone because most of them were on the take and they would uh, require more and pocket money. And, you know, it was just horrible. And then there were those who collected taxes for the church, but there were also those who collected taxes for Caesar which made you a horrible person to the Jewish brothers and sisters around you because you were working for Caesar and they hated Caesar as if he was the Antichrist. So, uh, this fellow was working for Caesar. That's how, and he was a Jewish boy, but that's how um, bad he was. He was a very sinful man in their society. He was hated by everyone. But Jesus said, follow me. And he got up and followed him. So Matthew decided to follow Jesus. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And see, tax collectors and sinners. Of course, they're going to hang out together because tax collectors are sinners. Um, so anyways, um, they were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? And so, as they were asking this question, Jesus overheard the conversation. But when Jesus heard this, he said, Is it not those who... Oh, wait, sorry. I, this is one of my favorite things to say, and here I am, tongue-tied in, in knots here. It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick which is the truth. If you're healthy, you don't call a doctor. If you're sick, you call a doctor. So where is Jesus going to find what he's looking for, which is people to save? Is he going to find it in a church full of people who are saved, or is he going to find it somewhere else? Is he going to find it out on the street? Is he going to find it at the mall? Is he going to find it in a prison? You know, there's specific places. I mean, we're supposed to have mercy on the, on the convicted as Christians, period. There's no question. Anyway, um, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. And this is one of my favorite verses as well, here and elsewhere. These are the words of Jesus, but he's quoting scripture. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. That's the quote. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's the words of Jesus. Which means what I was saying earlier, uh, you don't call a physician if you're well. He wasn't there to save a church full of people, of righteous folks who were doing what God wanted them to do, okay? He was there to save tax collectors who everybody hated. He was there to save murderers. He was there to save the demon-possessed. He was there to save you and me, and he's here today. Still, I believe this in all my heart. So let's just go on. So compassion to the righteous sinners, okay? So this is where we're going to take some of these references here in verse 13 where it says, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So one of those references right there is to Hosea. Uh, and I already have that marked with these handy dandy uh, tabs that my wife bought for me. I love them. Uh, so Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 says, For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So God would rather that you be loyal and know him than give him a bunch of money and burn a bunch of sacrifices. You see what I mean? What's more important to him is that you know who he is and you do what he says. That's what's more important, not what you give him. You see and that's what that was getting at. And then after that, it says, But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. And that's what it is. We're covered under the sin of Adam. And we have transgressed the covenant. You see? And that's why the new one is required. Anyway, um, so we'll go back here to verse uh, 13. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to make the reference to Matthew chapter 12, verse 7 that I mentioned earlier. Here, uh, so 12, 7 says, 
But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. And this references Hosea 6, 6 as well, because it is the same verse, and this is also the words of Jesus. So he uses this same verse two times in the book of Matthew. He uses it once in chapter 9 and once in chapter 12. So it's a very important verse. See Matthew. Okay, so then uh, we'll start here in chapter or in verse fourteen in Matthew nine, where we were at. Uh, then the disciples of John came to him, asking, "Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast?" The disciples of Jesus came because they were following Jesus, uh, because this, the message was the same: repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same message that John. So they were following him and asking Jesus what was going on. So this is how Jesus answers in, in verse 15. And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? Which means that as long as Jesus was with them, they didn't have to fast because he was there. Uh, but the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. And I want you to hear that. Then they will fast. This is the words of Jesus. He's asking us for something here. Uh, verse 16. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wineskin bursts, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage, your faith has made you well. And at once the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said, Leave, for the girl has not died, but she is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. This news spread throughout all the land. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind man came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And, and this is very important. Uh, I don't know if you've heard it, but... Uh, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. That's what he said when the, the woman touched his garment. Uh, so he told her, It's because you believe in me and the power of God. You see what I mean? That's why it works. And then again, here, uh, it shall be done to you according to your faith. This is what he tells the blind men. And they believe that Jesus can touch them and they're going to see, or Jesus can heal them no matter how he does it, touch them, whatever. But they believe that he can, if you will. So uh, it says, according to your faith. Uh, the, and your eyes were op And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them. See that no one knows about this. And again, what, what man would perform such miracles and do them in secret except for the Son of God? Or try to do them in secret. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all that land, which defeated what Jesus wanted to do. He didn't want to be in the spotlight. He wanted to help people and continue to move. But when he's in the spotlight, he's surrounded by crowds and various things. But yes, so as they were going out, a mute, possessed, demon-possessed man was brought to him. 
After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He casts out demons by the ruler of demons, and that's because they were jealous, because they couldn't do the same. Yet they were holy men who lived a holy life. You see, and here was this lowly carpenter, or whoever he was. I think they probably knew basically who he was by then. Um... 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what Jesus was saying. That's the message that John had, and that's the message that Jesus has. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means to repent and come back to God, to get away from your sins, to be baptized in the blood of Jesus in the water. The whole deal. Repent. Repent. That's, that's the message. Uh, so Jesus was going through all the cities teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness uh, then 36 seeing the people he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep with or like sheep without a shepherd okay that's in there because it is a uh, the, because Jesus feeling this feeling is um, prophecy fulfilled. So this is where we're going to go to uh, um, Zechariah 10.2. Yeah, Zechariah 10, verse, or chapter 10, verse 2. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing, but uh, it has... Anyway, for the teraphim speak iniquity, and the diviners see lying visions and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted because there is no shepherd. I just, uh, for some reason, connected those two in my own readings. I read that, and, and it sounded to me like it was a prophecy. And uh, this is right here telling me that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy because he felt that. He saw that. He was watching the people. No wonder afflicted. Uh, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And once again, it's because they were surrounded by these believers that needed a shepherd. See? Uh Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And uh, that's the last verse in uh, Matthew chapter 9. And uh, those are the, the references that uh, I took you on from this, just because those are the ones I have handwritten in, in my own Bible for whatever reason. Um, but the main thing that I gather, especially for me, out of this is that uh, your faith and faith is not just faith like like believing that God can do this and that it's also faithfulness you know being able to to do what God needs you to do you know he asks us to do things and promises to do things and you see what I mean so it's a give and take relationship we have to be holy to him you know and listen to his word and listen to his will you know, which is really simple. If you love God and you love men, you pretty much got it covered. Uh, those are the two basic rules. Love God and love men. Even when you don't want to love men, love men. You know, that's the rule, though. Uh, so, thanks for listening to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 9. And God bless. And uh, I'll be back with you soon. Amen.